We'll wait for you all to be seated. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jim Gagliano, and, and I'm honored to be here today and to participate in this conference once again, and very happy to be among so many friends and colleagues here in Paris. And like Nick before me, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Monsieur Romanet and the France Gallo team, Hubert and Bertrand in particular, for all their hard work and excellence in organizing the various events over the past few days. In the United States, the Jockey Club uh, puts on a little conference in August uh, called the Roundtable, and it's only two hours, so I have a great appreciation for all the hard work that goes into this event. As a vice chairman of the IFHA, I'd like to uh, also acknowledge and thank our good friends at Longines, uh, in particular uh, Juan Carlos, for their sponsorship. In the next hour or so, you'll hear a lot about marketing and branding. That's the title of this, uh, this presentation, and clearly no one does it better than Longines. I believe uh, in that regard, everyone in this room would agree that our new association with a world-class company like Longines greatly enhances the image of the IFHA and of this conference. I'd also like to thank uh, my three outstanding panelists, with whom you'll hear from shortly, and the center, Mike Mulvihill of, of Fox Sports Media Group. Uh, on to the end, uh, Jean-Christophe Gilletta of France Gallo, uh, and Bill Karstangen of Churchill Downs Incorporated, closest to me. So the title, as I mentioned, Marketing and Branding of Racing is certainly a broad heading for a very broad topic. So I'd like to spend a few minutes, just as we get started here, defining uh, those terms. And let's, let's start with marketing. We went up and uh, did a little research. The American Marketing Association Board of Directors defines marketing as, quote, the activity, set of inst institutions and processes for creating communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and for society at large. A dictionary definition is more concise. The action or business of promoting and selling products or services, including market research and advertising. So what's branding? BusinessDictionary.com defines branding as, quote, the process involved in creating a unique name and image for a product in a consumer's mind. Branding aims to establish a significant and differentiated presence in the market that attracts and retains loyal customers. A legendary American advertising executive named Leo Burnett, many of you no doubt have heard of, defined a brand symbol as, quote, anything that leaves a mental picture of the brand's identity. That sounds almost existential. Others have referred to a brand in different ways. A brand is a promise. A brand is the emotional aftertaste that comes after an experience, even a secondhand experience with a product, service, or a company. So I'm neither a marketing nor a branding specialist, but I'm going to share with you a short story uh, about one of my first forays in the area of marketing and branding at, as a young racetrack employee in the 1980s at a racetrack in New Jersey. And clearly the lesson I learned from this was that there are good ideas and there are bad ideas, and it's much better to have more good ideas than bad ideas. And I'm quite sure when, by the time I get to my story, you'll be more thankful that I'm just moderating this panel and not a marketing person. So 25 years ago, uh, in search of a promotion idea to, to spur attendance at the racetrack I worked at, I did some research and I came across uh, a, a, a guy by the name of T.C. Thorenston. He was a cowboy from Wyoming, and he traveled the country with a racing buffalo named Harvey Wallbanger, which was also the name of a drink, but that's a different story. T.C. was the owner, the trainer, and the rider, and with this buffalo, they would challenge racehorses at various racetracks in match races. Harvey weighed 2,000 pounds. If anyone's seen a, a buffalo live, uh, they can, that you can attest for its immenseness. immenseness. And they could, uh, this buffalo could cover a 110-yard distance in about 10 seconds. And it was said at these short distances that he was unbeatable. So after reading about Harvey and seeing the crowds he'd attract at, at some racetracks around the country, I thought it might be worthwhile to bring T.C. and Harvey to Monmouth Park in New Jersey and have a, him compete in a match race on a Saturday. Uh, which is the, the, the big day of racing. Many people in New Jersey had never seen a buffalo before, so we thought it'd be fun. 
Fortunately, we had the foresight to schedule a rehearsal in the morning, uh, a few hours before the actual racing program started. So to make a long story a little shorter, we, uh, we had the buffalo come into the, to the racetrack in the morning and we led him into the starting gate and immediately the buffalo seemed to um, become unruly. Uh, he, he was distracted and unruly. I was sitting in my office, I was watching on closed circuit television and I could see the 12 ton starting gate starting to rock and I saw little clouds of green and white and I realized that was the paint being pulverized by his horns as he was rattling them away. Um, the poor horse that we brought into the, the stall next to him uh, that was going to be in the match race uh, looked at him, his eyes were as big as saucers, immediately went through the gate, uh, took one step out, busted through the gate, the jockey went down and the horse bolted and ran back to his barn. Meanwhile, the assistant starters had this buffalo in a gate and what do you do then? So they just, they just start, they, they just opened the stalls and just, you know, yeah, let's go. The buffalo took one step out of the gate and immediately tore 50 yards of rail out uh, as, he, as he searched for the infield. So that day, um, fortunately, some of the carpenters I was very friendly with, and they quickly repaired the fence and the rail so that we could, uh, we could conduct that day's racing. But I can tell you that if they weren't there and were not unable to do that, I would be doing something very different right now. So with that, uh, uh, as the buffalo, in the aftermath of my buffalo gate, I, I ran into TC uh, charging down from my office and I said, what happened? I thought you did this at 20 racetracks around the country without any problem. You know, what, 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 what wrong, went wrong? And he said, well, you're right. We did do it at all these racetracks, but I forgot to tell you one important thing. That was a different buffalo. So I'm happy to report that later that day we did have a match race and Harvey did run a straight line and we had a crowd of more than 10,000 people, but that was the last time I got seriously involved in marketing, branding, or racetrack promotions. So back to the subject at hand. Thank you for that opportunity. I, I know that uh, marketing and branding of the sport has been discussed at this conference in the past and it's nothing new. Uh, David Nathanson of TVG talked about attracting the next generation of, to horse racing back in 2007. And Jean-Pierre Kratzer of Switzerland discussed marketing in smaller markets in 2008. In 2009, uh, the BHA's Nick Coward talked about the promotion and rebranding of racing, and John Della Volpe of Harvard University shared perspectives on recruiting new customers through the internet. Many of the organizations represented here today have undertaken major and very diverse programs in trying to attract uh, uh, newcomers to our, our business. We're familiar, uh, for example, with the uh, Great British Racing Initiative, Love the Races, and also some of the incredible marketing programs uh, undertaken by the Hong Kong Jockey Club. We all know about the Go Racing program in, in Ireland, and many of us are familiar with the imaginative and picturesque ad campaigns from France Galo and the clever advertisements of the PMU. We know what Dubai has done in uh, bringing the Dubai World Cup to, uh, to the world. And to reach younger fans, there's the Race Day, schools, uh, Race Day for Schools program in the, United, in the United Kingdom as well. Years ago, the JRA built a campaign centered on jockeys, uh, on the jockey Yutaka Take, to appeal to young female demographics. Uh, Dr. Sato spoke earlier today about the, uh, the marketing programs that the Japan Derby uh, undertakes. And back home, the NTRA launched the Go Baby Go initiative in the late 90s. And of course, today, the Jockey Club of the United States is leading a marketing push on multiple platforms with the creation of America's Best Racing. So with the explosion of the internet, and more recently, social media, marketing tools have changed dramatically. Uh, no longer do we have to rely on just racing buffaloes. And clearly, uh, as you'll hear today, they'll forever be changing. The next three speakers we're going to, will share some of their expertise, some of their experiences as they reach out to new customers, viewers, and to fans. And each of them has assured, has assured me there are no racing buffaloes on their resume. Uh, the first speaker today is Mike Maldahill. As Senior Vice President of Programming and Research, Mike's responsible for programming, strategic planning, ratings analysis, advertising sales, and communications support throughout the entire Fox Sports Media Group. In addition to playing an integral role in the programming and research of News Corp's recently launched 24-hour uh, sports cable network called Fox Sports One, Mike plays an important role at Fox Sports in helping to maintain existing rights deals with the National Football League 
and Major League Baseball, as well as acquiring new properties. In fact, he was recently involved in the television rights deal securing the FIFA World Cup in 2018 and 2022. Mike uh, asked me to share that if anyone is interested in seating for, uh, seats for those, just to see him at the conclusion of today's program, and I have his card as well. Mike's been with Fox Sports for more than 15 years, joining the company in 1995 as a research analyst. His most recent promotion came in 2011 when he was elevated to senior vice president. Mike's a great racing fan, and we welcome him today. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to start, um, even before I get to my remarks, I just want to start by showing a very brief video on Fox Sports, uh, introduce you to our company, and more specifically to our new network, Fox Sports One. So if we can, let's go ahead and roll that tape. Uh, and this is only about a 90 second video. Fox Sports One is America's new sports network. Born of the Fox Sports DNA. Powered by the collective and resources of 21st Century Fox. Relentless in its commitment to the fan. Passionate about the game. And broadcasting daily a schedule of first tier sports properties that only Fox could assemble. Fox is ready to change the television landscape again. the last part. We missed the tag. We are Fox Sports is the tag of the video. Uh, thank you all again for inviting me to be with you today uh, and for giving me a few minutes of your time. Uh, again, my name is Michael Mulvihill. I am the Senior Vice President of Programming and Research for Fox Sports based out of New York City. Uh, as Jim mentioned, I've been with the company about 19 years. As you can tell, I started when I was nine years old, uh, which was exciting for me. Um, I will try to be brisk in my remarks because I don't think it would be uh, acceptable for a conference sponsored by a timekeeping company to run 40 minutes late. Uh, so I'll try to get through the, uh, the speech quickly. A uh, few of you may be aware that earlier this year, our company announced a partnership with Jim and his team at the Jockey Club that will bring Fox Sports back into the thoroughbred racing business for the first time in over 10 years, starting next February with the first of 10 racing telecasts highlighting the best of the handicap ranks on America's new sports network, Fox Sports One. We are delighted to be back in this game after too many years away, and it's been inspiring to be here today and to learn about the efforts of so many talented people across the globe to ensure the future strength of thoroughbred racing. It's been doubly inspiring to be able to spend the last few days here in Paris. Uh, I'm reminded that Oscar Wilde once put a memorable spin on the notion of the afterlife for my countrymen when he suggested that, quote, when good Americans die, they go to Paris. I assure you that after getting a chance to see both the Chateau at Versailles and the great spectacle of the Arc firsthand yesterday at Longchamp, I feel like a very good and very lucky American, and I thank you all sincerely for including me in your conference. Every person in this room is in the media business. Every person whose livelihood depends on the health of sport and the health of thoroughbred racing is in the media business. You don't necessarily have to work for a global media company. If your events are televised, simulcast, streamed online, or written about anywhere, you are in the media business, and with that fact comes both challenge and opportunity. Challenge because media companies like ours do business in an environment of accelerating change and intense competition. Opportunity because there is simply no better way to convert potential consumers into loyal, lifelong fans than through strategic use of mass media. And so because we are all at some level media business people, my hope is that I can first spend a few minutes sharing with you some of what we see happening in the American sports media marketplace, and then offer some thoughts on how racing can position itself to take advantage of the trends that are reshaping our business. First, a few words about News Corporation and 21st Century Fox. I don't think there's a company in the world that has a stronger track record than we do at leveraging the power of sport to build media content businesses and to grow the assets of our partners. From the day Rupert Murdoch took over his father's newspapers in Adelaide, Australia in 1952, 
Our company has always recognized the unique power of sport to bring people together like nothing else. As we often like to say, sport connects us all to our friends, to our families, to our communities, and to our countries. And it is the power of those connections that drives our business models. We've never been afraid <clears throat> to place big bets on the power of sports content. In Australia, it was the creation of the upstart Super League of Rugby, which took on and ultimately merged with the established Australian Rugby League to form the National Rugby League of today. In the US, it was an aggressive 1993 bid to wrest rights to the National Football League away from 47-year incumbent CBS and bring them to what was then a fledgling Fox network. And most recently, of course, it's been the launch of our new national cable sports channel, Fox Sports One, in which we have invested over $9 billion to secure long-term rights to a broad portfolio of sports properties, including our partnership with the Jockey Club, with the goal of challenging ESPN's well-established leadership position. Our worldwide television presence now extends to over 350 channels, offering programming in 37 languages to a mind-boggling 1.3 billion homes worldwide. <clears throat> Our family of fully dedicated sports networks now covers every inhabited continent in the world, with the most recent additions being not only Fox Sports 1 and 2 in the US, but also Fox Sports Holland and Fox Sports Brazil within the last two years. And our portfolio of content partnerships is unrivaled. Simply put, and without exaggeration, Fox Sports is now delivering world-class athletic competition of all types from every corner of the globe to every corner of the globe. And it is my hope and expectation that thoroughbred racing will be an ever more prominent part of our offering in the years to come. Let me now talk a bit about the American media landscape. The United States, I believe, has the most robust and dynamic television marketplace in the world. We are still very much a TV nation, and sports marketers ignore this plain fact at their own peril. Although the internet has had profound effects on American life, the fact is that according to Nielsen Media Research, the average American still spends about seven and a half hours watching television for every one hour they spend online. Consumption of video content, including but not limited to live sports, is even more heavily lopsided in favor of traditional TV. 97% of all video content viewed in the US is still viewed on a traditional television screen, with just 2% viewed on a computer and less than 1% viewed on a tablet or a mobile device. Americans are heavy consumers of television by global standards. Of the 26 countries monitored by Nielsen, the US ranks third in daily per capita television usage. In the US, it's television more than any other medium that defines our common reality and it's all but impossible to maintain relevance in America in business, politics, or culture without being relevant on television. So we know that nothing in American media is more powerful than TV, and furthermore, we know that nothing on television is more powerful than live sports. Sports have been the beneficiary of broad, ongoing trends in the way that people use media and technology. Greatly expanded channel availability via cable and satellite providers has given consumers more choice than ever. While the expansion of digital video recorder technology has allowed consumers to record their favorite shows and watch them anytime at their leisure, which is challenging for advertisers. Because live sports still draw a broad audience and are overwhelmingly viewed live as they happen, our programming has become more powerful. We also know that the sports advertising marketplace follows the simple laws of supply and demand. Viewers that watch the least television and are therefore the hardest for advertisers to reach command the greatest value, and that is to the advantage of sports programmers like us. Younger viewers, men, and more affluent homes all statistically watch less TV than the general population, but they are all also disproportionately heavy consumers of sports. The real-time presence of those hard-to-reach consumers is what makes sports valuable to sponsors and it prevents a well-known challenge and a less well-known opportunity for thoroughbred racing, uh, as we'll discuss in just a moment. Because television still dominates the culture in the United States, and because nothing else on television can match our ability to deliver a mass audience in real time, the value of television sports rights has been skyrocketing, and companies like ours have moved aggressively to create new sports networks. These trends are in evidence not just in the US, but in major media territories around the world. Consider some of the most recent uh, notable deals for English language sports programming. In the US, NBC is now paying more than three times what our company previously paid for rights to the Barclays Premier League. 
ESPN's deal for the rights to the championships at Wimbledon was an increase of more than 100% over what NBC had paid for the same rights. In the UK, the most recent domestic deal for premiership rights saw BT and B Sky B pay a 70% increase over the previous deals. And while rights fees escalate, companies are moving quickly to create new networks to distribute this valuable programming. All of this leads finally to the questions of most obvious relevance to everyone in this room. How can racing take advantage of the trends that are driving the incredible growth of sport? What are the qualities of the racing consumer that can be leveraged strategically to help grow the business of racing? In considering those questions, I think the right place to start is by looking at the characteristics of the racing audience on television. Earlier I mentioned that the TV uh, advertising marketplace follows simple laws of supply and demand. The media consumers that are hardest to reach are the same ones most valuable to marketers. For those of us who program television, this creates something of a paradox. In most businesses, your most frequent, your most frequent customers drive the most revenue to the bottom line. In our business, it's just the opposite. Our most infrequent customers have the greatest value, and thus the paradox is that we spend most of our time and energy chasing the consumers who spend the least time using our product. This presents a difficult challenge for thoroughbred racing because the racing audience tends to skew toward the demographic that watches the most TV and therefore has the least value, older viewers. Half of all horse racing viewers in the United States are over the age of 60, which makes the horse racing viewer the oldest in all of American sport. Racing's demographic challenge is amplified somewhat by the, by the fact that the audience is roughly 50% female, which is in contrast to most televised sports for which the audience is typically about two-thirds male and one-third female. Now, on one hand, this is a unique point of differentiation for racing. However, at the same time, because women of all ages tend to consume more television than men, they have less value to marketers. It's the male consumer who is harder to reach and the younger male consumer who is toughest of all. And therefore, one of the most commonly asked questions in American sports is, how do we attract younger males? For years, this has been a vexing problem for horse racing, and certainly it has no easy answers. At Fox Sports, we try to tackle this challenge by hiring younger talent, employing innovative production techniques to create a unique visual difference, and promoting all of our sports properties in our youth-oriented entertainment programming. We are always focused on capturing the younger audience, and I like to think that our approach works. The average nighttime Fox Entertainment viewer is five years younger than the average viewer of our competitors at ABC, CBS, and NBC, and the average Fox Sports 1 viewer is three years younger than the viewer of NBC Sports Network, six years younger than the ESPN and ESPN2 viewer. We clearly intend to bring our commitment to attracting younger consumers to horse racing as well. If the age of the thoroughbred fan is a challenge, we must also acknowledge that the affluence of the racing fan presents a tremendous opportunity. The jewel events of horse racing attract a very affluent demographic, as was in obvious evidence yesterday at Longchamp. Consider the television audience for the Kentucky Derby in the United States. About 10% of all American homes tune in each year on the first Saturday in May for the Kentucky Derby, a figure that is comparable to the audience for a typical NFL football game or a World Series baseball game. However, if we look only at homes that earn over $200,000 a year, the highest income level measured by Nielsen Media Research, that figure jumps to 14%, an impressive 40% gain over the general population. In fact, viewing of the Kentucky Derby grows at each successive income level, a rarity in sports television matched only by obviously upscale events such as the Masters. High-income homes tend to watch sharply less television than lower-income homes, which creates value for those programs and events that are able to attract an affluent audience. I believe that the scarcity of the affluent demographic makes this a key attribute for the future of racing on television. <clears throat> Taking all of these trends that I've outlined into account, I believe that we can identify four important areas of strength and opportunity for horse racing in American media. Uh, and hopefully some, if not all of these, apply to many territories worldwide. Number one, as we just reviewed, racing delivers the highest income viewers. The jewel events of the sport attract consumers that are difficult for marketers to reach, and that holds great value. Number two, like all live sports, horse racing is live television programming in an increasingly on-demand environment. As more and more TV viewing is happening via digital video recorders, Sports takes on enhanced value because we are able to deliver our audience to marketers in real time. 
This trend will only accelerate in the years to come, and I believe it is absolutely essential to the future health of the sports industry. The combination of horse racing's appeal to high-income consumers and its propensity to be viewed in real time is powerful. If we again look at American TV ratings for homes that earn over $200,000 a year, but we limit the analysis only to viewing that happens in real time, so we exclude that time-shifted DVR viewing, we find that the Kentucky Derby attracts over twice as many of these high-income, real-time viewers as any nighttime entertainment show. That is a powerful marketing angle that I suspect has gone largely unnoticed by American advertisers. A third strength of horse racing <clears throat> is in the, remar the remarkable volume of events that the sport can supply to networks like ours. There are 457 graded stakes races in the United States, of which 111 are grade one, and most of these are either not televised nationally or their exposure is limited to 24-hour racing networks rather than general interest sports networks where they might be exposed to new and potential fans and betters. Just last week, the Jockey Club Gold Cup, a race featuring this year's Kentucky Derby and Belmont Stakes winners, was not available on fully distributed national television. For someone like me, who is charged with helping to program almost 9,000 hours a year of sports television, this represents a tantalizing opportunity. We are in the business of presenting live events of the highest quality, and horse racing has them in abundance. That wealth of high quality stakes races is related to what I believe is a fourth great strength of racing as in, and is in keeping with the theme of this afternoon, and that is the powerful schedule of top international events that are going almost entirely unseen in the United States. It is illogical to me that world-class spectacles like the ARC, the Melbourne Cup, the Dubai World Cup, the Tokyo Yushin and the Royal Ascot meeting are so difficult to find on American television. That has to change. These are precisely the events that give us the best opportunity to present horse racing as a glamorous cosmopolitan activity to the high income consumers that can drive the future value of the sport. The parochial American sports fan, separated by oceans from the wider world of sport, is rapidly becoming a thing of the past and not a day too soon. Horse racing must move to take advantage of this opportunity. International football is thriving on American television. Golf and tennis events from around the world are staples of the American sports calendar. Rugby is making inroads with Fox Sports 1 set to produce its first international rugby friendly in just a few weeks. It's essential that horse racing be part of this trend. And I hope that in the future, we can have productive conversations about making the networks of Fox Sports a home for the greatest events in world racing, as we in turn will look to distribute our American races internationally. I began my remarks by saying that we are all in the media business. I'd like to close by suggesting that we are all also truly in the business of uniting people and creating memories. We live at a time in which a lone person staring silently at an electronic device is considered social activity. Sports must be an antidote to that. I like to think of sports as the original social medium, and we must never forget that the true source of our value is in bringing people together behind a common hope, whether it's the hope of a favorite team winning a championship or the hope of cashing a ticket at the betting windows. The emotional connections created by sport, the bonds that we cannot measure, those are what drive all of the metrics that we can measure, not vice versa. Those connections are what we at Fox Sports believe in. That's what we invest in, connections and memories. And that's what will drive the future growth of horse racing and the entire business of sport. And in that spirit, I thank you all for the connections we've made, and I look forward to the memories still to be made. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. That was terrific. You're much taller than I am. Uh, Jean-Christophe has, uh, has more than 25 years of sports and entertainment experience with some of the most prominent events and organizations in the world. His resume includes work with FIFA, IRB, UEFA, UCI, CIO, IAAF, IMG, Live Nation, AEG, Stage Entertainment, and, and, and others. He spent nine years at IMG Paris involved in the marketing and sales of sporting events and the production of classical music events. 
Before that, he spent nearly 15 years at Stade de France, the last three as chief executive officer. The company created and produced concerts, family shows, and sporting events for stadiums in France and throughout the world. In the course of 10 years, he created and produced 55 shows and sold nearly 3 million tickets at those venues. This man knows production, he knows venues, and he knows marketing. Please welcome Jean Christophe. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, before to, to start my presentation, uh, I'd like to apologize because you will have to face for another 20 minutes another horrible French accent. <laughs> so if you do not understand me, please raise your hand and I will try to re-explain what I'm saying. Uh, I also would like to uh, thank uh, Louis Romanet and Jim for giving me the opportunity to do this uh, presentation in front of such uh, a prestigious audience. I'm very proud of it. Uh, here is a fun. Okay, the subject I'd like to present today is uh, about value creation in horse racing. Uh, value creation, when we talk about value creation, it's uh, uh, either we talk about material value, which is financial value, how do we create more turnover, more profit, more EBITDA? But there is also another kind of value that we can work on. Work on. It's intangible value, which is uh, awareness, the brand, notoriety. So we'll talk about both uh, today. France Gallo, you know everybody, is a non-profit association. And our mission is to encourage the improvement of the racing breeds in France and to develop resources for the professionals, which means the breeders, owners, trainers, and jockeys. In my words, in other words, I will say that it is to create new resources for the professional of the industry. As I said, new resources are financial resources or intangible resources. So our plan to create more resources and more value for our industry is the following. This is what we call the virtuous, circus, virtuous circle value creator. So around one strate strategic driver, the customer. Uh, we don't know about a lot about, about, about a lot about our customer, but uh, I know that it's more and more difficult to attract them on, on the race course. Uh, the customer is in the middle of our circle because the customer is the king. Around the customer, we have identified four levers which we can use simultaneously. First lever is the horse racing, what I call the product. The product is our product. The second levers Lever is the race course, the venue where we, the show will take place. The f third lever is uh, the owners. Uh, they are, of course, both customer, but they are more than customer because they are providing us with, uh, with the actors. And the fourth lever is the marketing. So when you put this all together, it has to create normally value. Still, still okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's back a little bit to our strategic driver, the customer. We don't really know who they are. And we don't really know what do they expect on the race course and what are their motivation. What do, why did they come on a race course? Why do they spend an afternoon at a race course? And uh, what we know is we are losing every year customer on the race course. Um, so we have made, we have started, we have made a huge survey, uh, marketing uh, study uh, during three months, which was on two phases. The first phase was a quantitative survey. Uh, we have interviewed more than 2,000 uh, people which have been interviewed on the race course and uh, also, of course, outside of the race course. 
A second phase was a qualitative survey organized in four focus group of 15 people each group. And we had 140 questions for each of this group. The first group was PMU beaters. The second group was race goers. The, the third group was what I call abandonist, people who used to go on a race course but they don't go anymore. And the fourth group was uh, refractories, people who say, I will never go on a race course. So we have interviewed these people during two hours and I have now a better idea of what they think about uh, horse racing or a race course. Our goal, in fact, is to define a customer segmentation. We really need to know what kind of profile uh, they have and in order to create dedicated, dedicated offers for each segment, in order to uh, communicate to each of these segments differently, and also in order to build a customer relationship management, management program. The customer relationship management program we want to put together, it's a, it's a CRM program, just normal one, but uh, the, 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 the intention is uh, we really have to take advantage of each and every contact phase we have with our customer to build a sustainable and profitable customer relation, relationship. We have identified five different phases. The first arrow on the left is where you need to create interest for your sport. We need to create, first of all, an interest for horse racing. Once you have created the interest, you need to create the desire. And then when you have created the desire, then that's where the prospective customer start to become a customer. And once he the customer, then you need to, to, to um, I would say, uh, um, build loyalty with him. And the last phase, which is how a customer can become an ambassador. How, when he, he leaves the race course, the day after, he can say to his uh, colleague in the, in the office or at home, I was in a race course and it's just a great experience. And that's how we would like to transfer to transform our customer to ambassador. Then let's come back about the first lever. The first lever is horse racing, the product. Uh, what we know from our interview, it's uh, people say is horse racing, it's an initiated show for the people in the know. It's, uh, n it's not very well known, not well known, but it's very difficult to understand horse racing because there are races every day, all over the year. We don't really understand the hierarchy between the races and uh, it's a complex world. So it's not a, an easy world, and uh, it's difficult to, as we say, to tell the story. So it's a difficult story to, to, to tell than to understand. If we compare with uh, our competitors, first of all, they have a strong brand, and the brand creates preference. Then I haven't seen a big brands, at least for uh, a season. We have big brands which are uh, events, big events, but there is no brand for a season. So we really need to create a brand to create preference for horse racing for a season. And then if you compare with uh, our competitor in tennis or rugby or, or, or in football, first of all, they have a brand and then they tell a story. A story has a beginning and has a, has a hand. And between the beginning and the hand, you must be able to tell the story every weekend or every two weekend. Then the people can follow the story. And uh, actually, I think it's quite difficult uh, during the year to follow the story of horse racing, at least in France. Then we have uh, chosen to, to work on this special story. And uh, we have worked on a, on a project, which is not uh, fully decided yet but it's, uh, 
a little bit what the, 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 what the, the British have created with the British Champion Series. It's a brand, well known. So we, have, we are actually working on a series of uh, 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 meetings which will start in April and will finish during the Hawk weekend. The final will take place during the Hawk weekend. It will be 35 races, including 20 group one uh, in five famous race courses and uh, distributing more than uh, 50 million euro of price money. So this is not fixed yet, but that's what we are working on in order to emerge on the, on the market on the, of the entertainment and sports market with horse racing. The second level, it's what I call the race course experience. What do we deliver to our customer? Uh, we also speak about customer race course corridor because the experience doesn't start at the fence of the race course, but the experience has to start much more, much more in advance, weeks in advance or, or days in advance. We have to talk to our customer much more in advance and offer them with a special offer or bundle offers and uh, we have to start to tell the story that we will deliver on the race course much more in advance. Then once on the, on the, on the race course, of course, we have to deliver a memorable experience and with the races and of, co of course also between the races. We have 30 minutes, 30 minutes on average between the races and it's not a handicap. I think it's an opportunity, an opportunity to address messages or uh, information to our customer. And then, uh, once the customer leave, leave the race course, the story is not finished. You still have to be in connection with the client, with the customer. You can send videos of the, of the racing, of the races. You can send a special offer for the, for the next races. And uh, the, the, the intention is to keep the contact with the customer as much as we can. Uh, after the races also. The third level, third lever are the owners. The owners are of course uh, our first customer and uh, actually we don't know them very well also. So we have also started a huge program, a huge survey to know exactly what are they expecting from us and uh, why they became uh, owners and uh, what they really expect from, from, uh, from horse racing. It's, uh, again, it's to build a segmentation between the owners in order to make sure that we address the best offer, the one who they are, they are uh, expecting, and uh, also in order to uh, create a, a memorable uh, owner's experience for them. Uh, we were also putting together a CRM, pro CRM program for, for our owners. The fourth level is marketing. Our strategy is to develop around our sports, horse racing, but around our uh, big events, a brand strategy. Uh, I have seen a few uh, um, definitions of, uh, of a brand. And I will tell you another one. A brand is there to create preference. You don't go to a supermarket to buy water. You buy Avion or you buy a Perrier. You don't buy water. So it is very important to rely on a brand in order to create preference for our sports. So in our case, we have um, three different uh, actions that we will put together. The first one is to position horse racing as a premium sport and has a premium brand. We have the, the chance to, when we, we, we talk to the people, uh, elegance is part of the experience that the people are looking for when they, go on, when they come on a race course, at least on the Gallup race course. And uh, I think we are, it, it will help, help really to position, first of all, as a sport and then has a brand, a premium brand. The second act is, as I said, to create a strong promotional vehicle in order to tell the story 
during a season. And in order to uh, arise on the market, on the entertainment and sports market, we really need to have a brand to arise on this market. And the third action that we will put together is to develop a brand strategy uh, with our main event. With, uh, we can position each of event differently in order to address each segment of population, the family, the wife, the, the women, uh, the, the, the young people. We have enough uh, uh, events in order to position themselves uh, that, that way. Finally, part of our strategy is our new race course, Longchamp, that uh, we should be built, should be ready for the arc in 19, two, 2016. Sorry, you have a first view here. Uh, as you can see, it is a building very well integrated in the Bois de Boulogne. It is a green building, and um, we will. Uh, keep the old, uh, uh, the old stand which is on the right hand side and we will uh, refurbish this, uh, this, this stand and we will destroy the two old stands in order to rebuild one big, uh, one big buildings, building. As you can see we will have four levels. The first level will be for grand public standing the first level, second level will be also for grand public but seated. The third level will be for the professionals, boxers and VIP seats. And the last level, the fourth level, will be for the suites and, uh, and uh, the restaurant. Before I stop this, uh, this presentation, I'd like to share with you one of my favorite citation, citation which is not from uh, Horseman but from uh, Albert Einstein. I think we have uh, very strong assets in horse racing. We have a strong knowledge. What we need to work on is now more imagination. Thank you for your attention. That was great. I assure you, your English is far better than my French. Jean-Christophe. Much appreciated. Bill Karstangen was promoted to President and Chief Operating Officer of Churchill Downs Incorporated in March 2011 after previously serving as CDI's Chief Operating Officer from 2008 to 2011 and as Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and G Chief Development Officer for the company from 2005 to 2008. Bill joins CDI after serving as an executive with General Electric Company He's a graduate from the University of California at Berkeley and received a law degree from Columbia University in New York. Bill has a deep appreciation for marketing and takes pride in knowing his customers and knowing how his, his employees treat those customers. He proved that in 2010 when he appeared on, this, on the hit CBS television reality show, Undercover Boss. Today, we've got the real Bill Karstangen here with us. Bill? Thanks, Jim. Uh, uh, Louis Romanet, uh, Jim Gagliano, I very much appreciate being invited to visit here. Uh, I've uh, met many interesting people. I saw a great day of racing. I've learned many, many interesting things uh, that are going to help my company when I go back. And uh, all that was asked of me in return is that I get up and, and address this audience and tell you a little bit about our company, Churchill Downs Incorporated, and also uh, talk a little bit about the event for which our company is most known which is the Kentucky Derby. Is that right? So um, the Kentucky Derby is um, known in the United States as the greatest two minutes in sports. It's a cultural and social phenomena. It's the longest continuously running sporting event in North America at 139 years continuous. Uh, one of the things we're most proud of is 
Uh, we are ranked as the seventh most valuable sporting event brand in the world, according to Forbes. And I'm particularly proud of that because we've been moving up in the rankings over the last number of years. Uh, we're behind events like the Super Bowl and uh, the World Cup. Uh, most recently, there were over 151,000 people who showed up for the most recent Kentucky Derby, and more than 16.2 million people that viewed uh, the event on television. So before I get uh, uh, too deeply into our company and, and this event, I want to remind myself that, uh, that I was asked to talk a bit about marketing. Um, and Jim, I thought you gave a, a great overview and definition of marketing, and I think the other panelists uh, offered some insight as well. I tend to simplify it. Um, uh, when I think of marketing, there are many, many different types of marketing, from product marketing to, uh, to consumer marketing. But I really think of uh, the purpose of marketing. What are we trying to do when we market? Are we trying to create awareness? Uh, we're trying to create engagement. Um, uh, we're trying to incentivize customer behavior. So when I look at this audience, uh, I have to confess that um, while I, sp I frequently speak about my company in the United States, I've never actually spoken about Churchill Downs overseas, and I'm not aware that any of the executives from our company have addressed this audience uh, at any time in the recent past. So I don't know what you know, but I want to engage you a little bit. I want to incense you to, to uh, talk a bit about the Kentucky Derby. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. So everybody wake up, because if you're, if, if you're not, I'm going to call on you. I'm going to ask you a series of questions about the Kentucky Derby, and you tell me and you tell the audience uh, what you know about it. First, and, and in return, if I can get you to do that, if you don't do that, I'm going to stand up here uh, embarrassed. But if I can get you to do that, I've got some prizes for you. So I've got some gifts. You won't go away empty-handed. You'll, you'll get some T-shirts and some hats uh, for stepping out uh, on the ledge here. So first, what city does the Kentucky Derby take place in? You know, I'm going to try not to call on Americans, but I'm going to call on Americans if nobody else offers. What city? Oh, we had. Jim's going to have to be the judge of who, who says first. When does the Kentucky Derby take place every year? Yes. And I'm not just kissing up to the chairman. <laughs> the chairman was first. Who won the last Kentucky Derby? Somebody over here. There we go. Tell me one of the owners of Orb. Ah. Uh, you already got a prize. Somebody. Sir. Yes. Oh. Okay, um, what year did the great secretariat win the race? Craig, how many, how many Craig is? Oh, we've got more. Couple more. Uh, can anybody name a Philly that's won the race? Oh, don't forget to give one to Craig. Okay, I've only got a few more things. Somebody else shout out something interesting about Kentucky Derby to them and you get a prize. Anybody, tell me something that you know that you want to tell the audience about the Kentucky Derby. Mint juleps. Mint juleps, there you go. That's a classic. See, if I don't ask this question, things like that are going to get, uh, not get covered. That's our famous uh, alcoholic beverage on uh, Kentucky Derby Day. Any, anybody else? My home yes. I've only got two more. Sir. He beat you to it. Two more t-shirts. No, no. <laughs> Pardon me? Who is? Oh, OK. Uh, yes. Oh, wait. Last one. Mile and a quarter. The distance. All right, the bag. Who, want, who needs a bag? <laughs> Sir. 
Uh, it's gold-plated, but, but you know what, close, close enough. Uh, anybody that volunteers um, deserves something. So thank you for that. So we're talking about marketing and about growing a business. You know, first, Churchill Downs is a public company. We are owned by shareholders. We're listed on the NASDAQ. Uh, we are measured every quarter by the stock market. Uh, we have a public investment ba investor base that we have to be responsive to. So anytime we talk about marketing decisions and growing the company, we have to do it in a context of responsibility that goes beyond passion. Many of us in the company are very passionate about the business, but we have a fiduciary responsibility that always is something that we have to be respectful for or towards. So first, as we get into talking about what we've done in the company, what's the background? Uh, Andrew covered some of this. It's been covered in a couple different presentations. But you can see there are some troubling long-term trends in U.S. horse racing. Uh, thoroughbred handle has been dropping. Uh, the foal crops, just as, uh, just as concerning, have been dropping as well. And in the Kentucky Derby being a race for three-year-olds, uh, um, uh, we're very concerned when we see overall drops in these kind of numbers. So we saw these trends for a while. Uh, it's not something that materialized in the last year. Um, and we made changes in our company. Uh, and we made choices. And part of the theme that I'll cover here over the next several pages um, is that all racing is not created equal. Some racing is very much worth investing in. You can build it. You can grow it. But you can't do everything. You have to pick. You have to pick what you want to focus on. You have to pick what you can make a difference. You've got to pick where your best people and your capital dollars can most drive improvement. So starting with just the point 2005, which just happens to be when I joined the company, you can see our company at its highest level looked very different than it does today. Uh, in 2005, we had seven different racetracks. We were running close to 700 days of racing a year. Today, we are four racetracks, so we, we uh, have sold some of our racetracks, and we run about 380 days. So we shrunk the number of racing, but yet have invested, as I'll show you over the next several pages, we've invested quite a bit in, in growing our racing business. And the, the middle... Uh, chart just shows that even though we shrunk the, the amount of racing product we have, uh, generally the stock market has recognized the choices we've made, they've viewed them as smart, and uh, we've been able to drive shareholder value in our stock price while changing our business uh, and, and growing it. This is what the company looks like today. Today, um, you can think about our company as really divided into three different divisions. We have our historic uh, and lifeblood racing business, which is all we had seven or eight years ago. Uh, today, that is a healthy, growing business. Uh, you can see the, the revenues. You can see the earnings from that business. We have a gaming business that is uh, about the same size. It's actually larger now. So one of the advantages in the United States is the opportunity to diversify into other gaming products. So we've gone into brick-and-mortar casino gaming. And that division, uh, with five casinos, uh, soon to be six, has actually grown as large as the racing business, or the brick-and-mortar racing business. And then finally, there's been our online business, which is very much a horse racing business. In the United States, online wagering on horse racing is the only legal form of online wagering. And uh, we didn't have this business in 2007. We started it. It is today the, uh, the largest online horse racing wagering business in the United States, and it continues to grow rapidly. But what I'd say about all three of our divisions uh, is they're growing at different rates, but they're all growing quite healthily. They're all, they're all improving. They're all growing. They're all in very, very good shape. So for us, how do we succeed in racing? Uh, we, we think that's a journey. We're not at a point where we consider ourselves successful. We're building. We're learning. That's one of the advantages of coming to a conference like this. I saw lots of great ideas and heard lots of great ideas for how we can get better. Fundamentally, though, uh, we approach growing our business and improving our business as an um, exercise in capital investment and an exercise in technology. Uh, and fundamentally, it's about our customers. So we have to improve our facilities. We have to improve our customer experiences. And generally, we have focused on capital improvements and technology innovations in order to do those things. Before I get into a uh, series of examples of what we've done, here's just a picture of the Derby. 
just a couple key metrics. There's a lot of, and we heard some of these things that, uh, that come to people's minds when they think about the Kentucky Derby. But here are just a couple key general metrics to think about when you think about the event. Uh, generally, when we talk about attendance, we talk about the attendance for the week. So there are really two very large days, Derby Week. There's the Kentucky Oaks Day, which I'll talk about in a minute. That generally produces a crowd of about 115,000. And then there's the Kentucky Derby Day, which produces a crowd of 150 to 165,000 people. Those, uh, those numbers have been trending up. Uh, they're impacted in any given year by the weather. Anybody familiar with Kentucky in the springtime understands that uh, it can rain very, very hard. It can be unpleasant sometimes. So that'll impact our, our attendance somewhat, somewhat modestly. Uh, we've been growing the wagering on the Kentucky Derby. Uh, uh, every year, we've been setting the record continuously every year. It's nothing compared to some of these Hong Kong figure, figures I've heard about during this, this conference. But for the United States, you're talking about an event that was about 1% of all of the wagering across the United States five or six years ago. Now it's 2%. That's a combination of U.S. wagering generally declining a little bit, and it's uh, along with the fact that the Kentucky Derby continues to grow very steadily. So. Uh, Wagering on the Kentucky Derby, uh, that's about almost 2% of U.S. handle for the entire year. Our television uh, uh, viewership, uh, it's been very strong. Last year was the second highest uh, rating since 1989. So generally, our viewership has been steady, strong, recently growing. I actually learned some things about how uh, networks uh, view our product for television pur uh, purposes. So I thank you for that, Mike. I actually learned a few things. Uh, in your discussion about the Derby part. Um, so those are the big picture metrics when you think about the size of this event. So how do you make it better? Well, uh, we'll talk in a minute about things we do on the day, but we also thought a lot about um, how do we expand the, the, uh, uh, the period of time that people are thinking about our event. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, for the casual fan, and again, an event like the Kentucky Derby is largely driven by casual fans. There's a huge component of general interest across the country, and how do you grow that? How do you, how do you drive that? How do you get more people to watch on television, more people to show up at the event? Well, we decided that we had to retake the process for qualifying for the Kentucky Derby. We thought, uh, you know, historically it had been based on graded stakes earnings, and uh, there were too many races being created. There was too much interference with the size of the prizes uh, being varied. And it was completely confusing in our customer research. Customers, consumers didn't understand how you qualified for the Kentucky Derby. So in a sense, we were holding a finale, a Super Bowl or the World Cup finals um, for three-year-olds, but nobody paid attention to the season. Nobody knew the season was going on and the Derby would sneak up and surprise them. So one of the things that was in a marketing initiative for us that we'll build out continuously over the next couple of years is uh, we took away the historic path to the Kentucky Derby and made up a new way. We picked the races and we assigned points to them so that we could set a, a process and a, uh, a road that could be followed by casual fans. We started from the perspective of how do you write this newspaper article for the casual consumer so when they read this article three or four weeks from the Derby, they understand what horses have qualified, what horses haven't, and when are they going to qualify. That's how we started it, all oriented towards the casual fan, all trying to convince uh, the casual consumer in the United States to pay more attention to this process because it's easier to understand. And I think um, um, if I could offer a lesson from a person that uh, was new to the industry when I joined the company, is uh, I would offer the, uh, the perspective uh, uh, to keep it simple. Keep it simple. We, to get new fans, you can't expect them to show up the first day at the racetrack and love the sport and understand the sport and to completely accept the sport. They have to be educated. And to be educated, they have to have a degree of confidence. They, they have to have a degree that they understand enough about what's going on to participate in it and enjoy it. And that's why we started the road to the Kentucky Derby so that we could introduce people to the Kentucky Derby weeks in advance of the Kentucky Derby. They can open it up in USA Today and other newspapers and read a simple article that gives them a framework for understanding when the Derby is, what horses have qualified, and when the next qualification races will be.
Another event prior to getting to the day of the Derby uh, is the day before the Derby, the Kentucky Oaks. Historically, this had been in Louisville, something called Louisville's Day. It had been the locals' day. Uh, we thought it could be much more than that. So we transitioned it to uh, Women's Day. It's a, uh, the Oaks race is a race for the Phillies, the three-year-old Phillies. So we wanted to shift the brand away from Louisville's Day to uh, uh, a day celebrating women's issues. So we did a lot of work, and we decided to go with the, um, a concept of cause-based marketing. So we partnered, and now we've done it a few times over the last four years, with major charities, female-focused charities, in order to drive awareness and interest in the female demographic in particular. And so when we do the Oaks now, uh, all the women dress in pink. And we have a survivor's parade for those that have survived different types of cancer, where they parade up and down the track prior to the Oaks so that their family members and the public can celebrate their, uh, their accomplishment and their achievement and build a better sense of community around that day. And for us, uh, it's been very successful. It's allowed us to donate to our community, to donate to charity. It's driven a whole level of interest in the event from a constituent that previously wasn't as interested, and they became interested because of the cause-based marketing uh, uh, that we do around the event. And the picture you see on the screen is just a picture of, uh, of one of the uh, survivors during one, one of the years of the Survivors Parade. It's a great chance to celebrate people um, uh, who have overcome something uh, in their life. And it is the fans that recommend and nominate people to uh, participate in the Survivors uh, Parade. Now on to the facility excel itself. Uh, not being classically trained in marketing, um, I would not be able to keep up with some of the, the fancy marketing concepts uh, in, in terms that are necessary uh, to really run a marketing department and are resident in our company. But for me, it's simple. What is the experience of the customer? What investments do you make in the customer to make their experience better, to guarantee that they have a great time? So back in 2005, uh, there was a major renovation, $120 million invested in the facility to upgrade the amenities, particularly in some of the more expensive areas and more expensive seats. Again, what is the purpose of that? It's so people will, will come and will enjoy their experience. And we have to remember something I say all the time, I don't view myself, I mean, we don't view our company as competing with other horse racing venues. We're competing with American sporting venues in general. So our standard that we think we have to meet is not what other horse race tracks have in the United States. It's what we see at the Dallas Cowboy football stadium. It's what we see in other new venues across the country. That's our standard. So back in 2005, the company took its game up, made a very serious investment to improve many areas of the track. And that's something that we've benefited from uh, mightily over the last couple years. We also wanted to give our core fans uh, other events during the year. We, we didn't want them to just think about the Churchill Downs racetrack as the Derby. We wanted to create other very special events. And we'd been trying for years to create them around just racing, but we found we needed more than that. And actually, some of these ideas, I, I have to confess, I saw some of this at play in Hong Kong. I saw some of this at play in Australia when I visited in the past. So to pick up on one of Nick's points, there's a lot of borrowing going on here. Maybe we put our own particular stamp on it, but there's a lot of borrowing. Uh, so we went hard into night racing. We installed uh, $4 million worth of lights, hired party promoters, created an atmosphere of celebration, and didn't really focus per se on the horse racing. We figured the people, as they got interested in coming, would absorb the horse racing and become more interested in that over time. Um, so although we put in lights and we could run lights, run under the lights anytime we want, we only run under the lights four or five times a year. And that's because we always want it to be special. We always want a great deal of energy, a great deal of enthusiasm. So you, it's, it's uh, just like uh, basic economics from college or from graduate school. You have to limit supply. You know, we, we, we didn't want uh, night racing every night. We wanted a limited supply of that to drive energy, to drive participation, to drive a different level of crowd and energy level. And that's been a, uh, a very successful thing for us. Most recently, this past year, we decided to create an entirely new area of the track and something that we didn't want to find anywhere else in the United States. We created a, an ultra high-end uh, hospitality area. This is a picture of it here on the screen. It's called the mansion. Uh, we didn't talk to racetrack architects. We didn't talk to any architect we ever worked with before. 
We went to Las Vegas. We met with people that had designed the clubs and the other hospitality areas and casinos. And we had a beauty contest where they all came in and pitched their ideas. And, and then we went with the one that we thought would best fit in with our venue. And the idea here is uh, uh, ultra luxury, uh, ultra high end. It's organized really as if it is a mansion where you have the uh, exclusivity of a, of a small area with half walls. So you have your, your individual party, yet they're only half walls so you can see the entire room. This is about a 14,000 foot space. You can see the entire room and you can feel a part of a larger group and a larger event. And uh, we were very shocked in our first year. We never expect anything we do to be wildly successful in the first year, but we're very shocked in our first year to have sold this out. These are the most expensive tickets that you can buy for the Kentucky Derby. They're a multiple more expensive than any others. Uh, it attracted people from uh, people who had never been to the Derby before, um, people that we'd never seen before, celebrities we hadn't seen before. So we were very, very pleased with this idea. Uh, again, I'd say the genesis of this is some of what we've seen in Hong Kong. Where we, again, we put our own particular stamp on it. Uh, um, but uh, we'll, we'll borrow when we can. Currently this year, so for next year's Derby, we're spending about $14.5 million renovating a portion of the track. So we're creating a few more new seats, but really what we're trying to do is improve the experience of our customers who already come. So you can ask us, and our board did, why do we need to invest with respect to tickets that we're already selling? Um, the answer to that is because if we don't invest, those people won't keep coming back if they don't have a great experience. So we wanted to create better food amenities, more restrooms, uh, broader promenades, uh, new space, exciting space that they hadn't seen before. Um, and that is something that you'll see for this coming year's Derby. We're in the middle of construction of that right now. Now this one's uh, my personal favorite. It, it's uh, an idea that belongs to our team. I'd like to cue the video and then I'll talk about it uh, briefly after the video. This will also be in place for the 2014 Kentucky Derby coming up. pitched this to our board of directors, um, they asked a very uh, sensible question, which is how much does something like this cost? Uh, and when they heard the answer, they, they said, well, do, do we have to spend that? The answer is it costs a lot. Uh, it's $12 million. And no, we don't have to do this. But uh, this is a really big television. And who doesn't love a really big television? Um, our board, when they thought about it, came to that conclusion. Who doesn't want a bigger television? Uh, for those of you who are from the United States, 
Uh, you probably think of it as I do. The, the standard for this has really been set by the, uh, the video board at the uh, Dallas Cowboys football stadium. This is uh, 30 to 40 plus percent bigger than that. So um, there currently isn't a bigger one of these in the United States. There's a NASCAR track or two that's announced they're going to build something of similar size or larger. Um, why do this? It's for the customer. It's so that we can give them the best experience. It's not just for watching the race. We will have uh, uh, production expertise to produce programming for this during the day so that uh, they can see all the areas of the track. They can not just be confined to the area they're personally sitting in. They can see all kinds of neat, interesting things that are happening on the track, celebrities, uh, chaos, whatever it might be. So uh, I think when I came to um, Churchill Downs the many years ago now, seven or eight years ago, the idea of doing something like this would have been hard for me. I came from GE and I had been in GE Capital and it was a finance-driven organization and I had a, a, a finance-driven job. Uh, but this is what it takes. This is what it takes to inspire your customer, to get your customer to come to your venue and then walk away and say, I, don't, I haven't seen anything else like that. Uh, I, I've never seen that before. That's what we're shooting for. So you have to have a little bit of faith, you have to have a little bit of confidence, and you have to be willing to take some chances and shake it up and uh, do projects that don't, don't always have uh, a, uh, a completely calculatable return on investment, but nevertheless you know makes sense and will make your event better and make it uh, a more memorable experience for your customer. So 2014, you'll see that at Churchill Downs. I'll conclude. Uh, uh, relatively quickly by just lamenting the fact that I can't talk about some of the other things that we're doing in the company because there isn't sufficient time. Uh, but a few years ago we vertically integrated and bought a tote company and it's allowed us to introduce a bunch of mobile technology on our track that's made a difference for us. Again, it's, it's uh, the point of this technology is to inspire the customer, to improve the customer's performance, to keep the, or, uh, the customer's attitude, to keep them from waiting in line, uh, to keep them from getting frustrated, to make their lives as easy and as enjoyable so they can spend as much time when they're at our facility doing whatever it is they want to do. But we're confident what they want to do is not wait in lines. So heavy investment in a technology like FastBet Mobile so people can bet on their uh, mobile devices and some other innovations. And again, we had to vertically integrate to do that. We just weren't finding that innovation elsewhere. And that, that's an observation about, about our industry, at least in the United States, I'd make. They want fans to come. They, uh, they think about fans from 20 or 30 years ago. Well, you have to invest to get these fans. Yeah, and, and you can call that marketing. You can call that product marketing. You can call, uh, it's, it's not just getting them to come to the track. It's, it's when they get to the track, what's their experience? How does it compare to other things they could spend their Saturday afternoon doing? And then um, Twinspires.com, our, our ADW business, or I'm sorry, account deposit wagering, that's the internet business in the United States. This has been a, uh, a labor of love of many of us in the company because uh, we went from not having this business to having the largest one. We put a lot of uh, energy and investment into this to improving it, and uh, I think all of us, if you told us five or six years ago we could have created this and, and made this happen, we would have taken that deal. It, it's gone better than we thought, and it's just the beginning. We, uh, it's just whetted our appetite uh, to do more things. So in conclusion, I uh, thank you for having me here. I've learned far more than, uh, than I've offered you. Uh, I've learned far more from you, from uh, what I've seen at the races yesterday and from some of the conversations I've had. Um, uh, but on behalf of my company, our company, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here and talk and to be a part of this event. Thank you. I want to thank Bill in particular for using this conference to announce his really big TV. Um, that's, uh, yeah, you heard it first. It'll be announced in the United States later today on video board. But uh, we decided to share it here first. We really appreciate that. That's a, that's a great honor. Thank you. Um, we heard a lot today about innovation and customers, and uh, certainly those themes run, run nicely through all the presentations. Uh, do we have time for any questions? Or uh, okay, I've got a couple, and then we'll throw it open to the uh, to the audience. I'll, I'll start with Bill. We'll go in reverse order, if that's okay. Um, do you see an opportunity to, subject to the ability you are you have to disclose these things, 
Do you see any opportunity to extend the CDI brand more internationally with this international audience? Uh, I'm sure that's a question that some might have. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, do we see uh, an opportunity to expand um, the, the Churchill Downs brand uh, broadly and internationally? Um, we'd like to find that. I, I'd say uh, in general, uh, although we do take big swings and big, big chances to, to do things in the United States, our issue internationally is there's so much we don't know. We don't feel that we necessarily have a competitive advantage or, or a unique understanding that allows us to uh, assume we'll be successful. So I, I think we'll um, learn more over the next couple of years and listen, and listen to what other people think is possible. But uh, the truth is right now our company is largely driven by uh, the American markets and the American opportunity. We don't have significant uh, investments or resources, personnel resources, devoted to figuring out the rest of the world. And maybe that's something we should do. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Christophe, I have a, a quick question for you. You've studied venues around the world. You've worked at some. Um, of the, of the non-racing venues that you visited, which one had the, the most profound impact on you and applications potentially to racing? A race course? A non-racing Ah, non-racing. So I didn't want to prejudice uh, you with anyone in this room. Um, the Dallas Cowboy Stadium? that you just talked about, with uh, the giant screen. Also the Wimbledon uh, uh, Stadium. What did uh, you take from those venues that you could, uh, you could bring to designs and in, in, in venue, racetrack venues? Uh, customer segmentation and the way they uh, can accommodate all kind of uh, segment of population and uh, all the VIP areas, um, ticketing system, uh, all the marketing they do, digital marketing. Sounds like a lot of things we can pick up from uh, visiting some of those other venues. Yes, I think so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, and Mike, um, in your time observing uh, the, the growth of Fro Fox Sports, what was the one technological innovation that made the biggest difference to, uh, uh, to productions that, that has made you such a leader, your company such a leader in television, sports television production? Uh, you know, one that we, well, there are a couple, uh, and some we can take credit for and some we can't. I think if any of you, those of you who are from the U.S. or have, have been exposed to American football, uh, the first down line uh, in, in broadcast of American football, I think, has been incredibly helpful because it's simple, uh, it's straightforward, and yet it increases everybody's understanding of the game. And, you know, as we look to our future in horse racing, what we're trying to accomplish is um, building a telecast that will educate consumers and draw them deeper into the game. And anytime you can use technology to educate and do it in a simple way, uh, I, I think that's a breakthrough. Um, so as far as technology, I would point to that. As far as camera angles, it's probably the cable cam that's suspended over the field uh, that really gives people a, a unique look and something that they haven't been able or had not been able to see previously, um, maybe not as simple as something like the first down line, uh, but really what, what David Hill likes to call a unique visual difference. I, I think we deliver on that. Excellent. Uh, we'll open it to Monsieur Romane. Uh, Mike, I'm surprised you didn't mention high definition. What is your approach of uh, coverage of racing and the use of high definition? Yeah, actually, that's, uh, it's great that you bring that up. It's almost... Um, so ingrained in our business now that I, I, it doesn't even come to mind right away. You know, that's just something that's so fundamental to, to our business. Uh, as we launch Fox Sports 1 and Fox Sports 2, we're committed to doing everything in high definition. And it's encouraging to see that as many racetracks have upgraded to HD as, as already have, 
certainly going forward, I think that's going to be fundamental for anybody who wants to use the power of television to reach consumers. You're just going to, you're going to have to be in HD. I mean, at this point, being in standard is, you may as well be broadcasting in black and white. I mean, it, it's, it's that far behind the time. So I, I think you're absolutely right. I think HD has been critical uh, to growing the sports experience. It's a much better display on those big TVs we like to buy. Um, any other questions from the floor? See, so how, how you see the challenge, what we learned is regarding customer segmentation is extremely ex uh, important. <coughs> and these customer segments want to have different experiences, especially the, if you look at the younger one, uh, the owners. Um, how you see, in a way, you address this uh, during, in a way, your covering of racing? Uh, let me just make sure I understand the question correctly. Yeah. How does customer segmentation yeah. affect our, uh, the way that we see yeah. racing yeah. and the potential for yeah. racing? Um, as far as the plans for our new channels, what we are really trying to develop is an environment that's welcoming to every type of sports fan. Um, some fans are more valuable to advertisers than others, but our whole business is shifting from a strictly advertiser-supported model to a mostly subscription-driven model. And as you make that transition, the more you move into a subscription-based model, the more all viewers have equal value. So instead of being obsessively focused on the younger demographic, we're going to move more and more into a world where the 60-year-old viewer who pays $100 a month for cable has as much value as the 25-year-old viewer who pays $100 a month for cable. So I think we're actually moving gradually away from being obsessed with segmentation and more towards being able to embrace uh, the entirety of the sports fan base. Um, you know, we talk a lot about sports, I talked a lot today about sports being something that brings people together. You can't go out there and say that we're going to bring people together, but only if they're 18 to 34 years old and make $100,000. You know, you have to create an environment where everybody's welcome, and because we're moving more in the direction of subscription-driven revenue, we're going to be able to do that. And Jean-Christophe, uh, uh Bill mentioned uh, the cost of his renovation, so can you give an idea of what will be the cost of renovating Longchamp? I can't hear you. The cost of Longchamp? <laughs> you should ask to... Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, the, the, the cost is about 120 million euros, what included. Fantastic. Any other... Oh, we have Duncan? Uh, Jim, this is a question for Mike. Um, he mentioned the fact that in football, the uh, cam going over the top of the field has increased the experience. Uh, obviously, you can't have that situation in horse racing, but do you see the use of drones giving a different perspective to the, the racing? Uh, wow. Um, I, I think that for our purposes in the, in the next year, we're unlikely to be able to make that kind of leap in, in the technology that we're going to be able to use. Um, I think longer term, it would be phenomenal to use something like that. Um, look, there are issues of competitive integrity in play there. There are safety issues in play there. Um, we had an unfortunate experience at a NASCAR race earlier this year where one of the cables in the cable cam snapped. Uh, and it really could have been a, a very, very serious incident. We were lucky uh, that it was not more serious than it was. And so when you're looking at these new technologies, they're exciting and you want to deliver the most immersive and, and enticing experience for, your, for the viewer that you can. Uh, but you really have to be cautious about not creating a potential safety hazard or, or a competitive integrity issue. Senior Nelson, you have a question? Yes, please. For the um, CEO of Churchill Downs, since you run a company that has um, casinos and racing operations, I would like to know if you have developed uh, loyalty programs for racing fans, for gamblers, and how has been your experience compared to those that the casinos run usually? Thank you. Um, really good question. Um, <clears throat> the loyalty, and I may tell you more than you want to hear, so... Um, the loyalty programs in the casinos are are really driven by the fact that um, uh, casinos are a much more efficient way of the customers uh, providing revenue to the casino. You know, for example, if you put a dollar in the in the slot machine, 
you might win back 90%, but pretty soon after you push the button or pull the reel a number of times, the entire dollar is now in the, in the, um, in the coffers of the company. That allows you to run much more aggressive rebating programs or, or CRM programs. With racing in the United States, you have a 20% takeout. Uh, the 20% the, the you keep gets divided up a number of ways. So for an on-track experience, you might have a margin of five cents of that customer's dollar. The customer thinks he's lost a dollar, but as far as you're concerned as the company, you've made five cents. So your ability to run comparable uh, CRM or ro loyalty or, or rebate programs, it's not the same. All dollars are not created equal. So our programs work a little bit differently between a consu uh, uh, casino customer and a racetrack customer. And they're also, their behavior tends to be uh, uh, different and somewhat segmented. Uh, we probably had the best experience about getting um, customers to experience both forms of gaming. We probably had our best experience at Fairgrounds, where it's, which is one of our casino racetracks, where uh, it's a very integrated grandstand and casino. But uh, generally, uh, there is some real segmentation between the consumer uh, in a casino and the racetrack uh, customer. Does that, does that answer your question? Great. Well, I think we've run out of time. I thank every, uh, the panelists for their excellent work and <laughs> appreciate your attention. So we come to the closing remarks. And if you are still there, uh, we will show you the film of the arc after. Uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it. Uh, so just to go back a little, uh, in October 1993, all the delegates uh, who were attending the 27th International Conference unanimously agreed to follow up the proposal of my father to establish an international federation of horse racing authorities. Our statutes were registered on December 23, 1993, and I was elected for my first mandate in March 1994. So for my 20th anniversary as chairman of IFHA next year, I will propose to the ExCO members to make a presentation at this conference on the future strategy of our federation. I feel it will be the right time due to the new resources coming from our partnership with Longines, uh, which uh, should continue until 2023. Uh, if the Executive Council still trusts me, I would then celebrate 30 years as chairman, while I would be only 76 but I assure you that I am not like Seb Blatter, the president of FIFA, who at 77 has declared that he is against any age limit. Uh, but let's review today's conference and draw the principal conclusions. General Assembly and regulatory issues, uh, we talked about our governance. I want to say that our new statutes, which have been unanimously accepted today, uh, are, are working very well. The chairman and vice chairman have been sharing new responsibilities since the beginning of this year and have well succeeded in their missions. Winfried with the new part partnership with OIE and FEI. Jim with our communication, promotion and commercial issues. Brian with the quality control of great addresses. Myself with the negotiation and signature of the Longines partnership. But we still have a lot to achieve. 2014 will be an important year for the with the, 20, with the 35th ASEAN Racing Conference in Hong Kong in May, and 2015 will be the first year of the new Pan American Conference in June between North, Central, and South American country. And I would like to congratulate Jim Gagliano and Marcel Zaro uh, for that excellent initiative. The departure of Aki and the progressive stepping down of Roland de Vos were big challenges. We've been very lucky to have the support of the Asian Racing Federation, the US Jockey Club, OSAF, the EMHF European Federation, Weatherbees, and France Gallo to build a new team with more regional uh, decentralization. For the press, I would like to review quickly some of the major issues raised this morning during our, our General Assembly. As you can imagine, I will mention medication. What, whatever will be the term of my position of chairman, I can guarantee you that the fight against medication will remain as my absolute priority. We must eradicate it in all graded and black type races, which are the races that make the breed worldwide. 
So the total ban on anabolic steroids in Australia and New Zealand for training and racing is great news for our industry. And I want to publicly congratulate the Australian Racing Board and New Zealand Thoroughbred Racing for taking the decision. I'm also delighted by the progress made in South America, where Lizix is now prohibited in all grade one and grade two races and totally prohibited in all graded and black type races in a country like Brazil. In USA, the Breeders' Cup had taken a leadership decision to prohibit anabolic steroids in all its races from 2008 onwards. It was followed by the ban on Lizix in two-year-old races in 2012, with a total ban planned in 2013, but unfortunately, the Breeders' Cup has been obliged to reverse its policy on Lizix for 2014. However, we still hope progress can be achieved uh, in the future, as its chairman, Bill Farish, recently declared, we are hoping to convince horsemen of the long-term vision of running medication-free. So good luck uh, to succeed into it, Craig. I know it will be difficult. Also last year, Jim Gagliano told us that the Jockey Club core belief was that horses should complete, compete only when they are free from the influence of medication. So let us hope that the future will be brighter if these two influent bodies share our approach and you can rely on me to keep permanent pressure on them as chairman of IFHA. Concerning breeding, as I told you this morning, we must fight by all means against artificial insemination and cloning. Andrew Harding commented the ex excellent decision of an Australian judge against the introduction of AI in Australia, and we must now follow very closely the appeal. The testimony given to the Australian court by myself, Winfried, and several others of our members was very useful. There is also a lawsuit in Texas through which horsemen are asking a federal judge to force the American Quarter Horse Association to register cloned horses and their offspring, arguing that it is violating antitrust law by refusing to do so. Both AI and cloning are strictly forbidden for the thoroughbred by the International Stud Book Committee's regulation, but you must also include it in your national rules of racing in order to have a strong defensive front against these purely commercial attacks. It is one of IFHA's primary missions to do everything we can to protect the breed of the thoroughbred. Concerning health, safety, and welfare of jockeys, uh, which is very important, the concept of a jockey's insurance card will be studied to guarantee that a jockey riding abroad is insured. It was also agreed that uniform reporting levels for prohibited substances was a priority at international level depending on laboratories' capabilities. Uh, for, as far as the Open Forum is concerned, uh, it was for the first time transmitted live uh, on video stream for the, uh, all the afternoon. We received reports from EMHF and ARF showing us how well these two federations are coping with the support of developing countries. Andrew Harding has been updating us on the very important subject of intellectual property rights, and Brian Cavana has outlined the continuous progress of the implementation of quality control, especially in South America, and the questions arising for its future around the world. We had very interesting presentation on Japan with an exceptional racing and wedding country, and Uruguay, who should be promoted back to part one in the not too distant future. Andrew Chesser presented us the 2012 and 2013 economic trends, which are showing good signs in a very difficult economic environment. Andrew told us that we should always look to innovate and reinvent the racing product, especially in the face of economic challenges and growing competition for the money wagered on racing. We had an outstanding and passionate presentation uh, from our keynote speaker, Nick Nicholson. Uh, he noted the importance of worldwide cooperation and mutual respect among racing authorities. He outlined the benefits gained when racing and studbook organizations come together in such a manner, noting the success of the ISBC and its role in the global commerce of thoroughbred. Nick also stressed three distinct areas that authority must focus on in meeting the demands of the new modern racing fan. Winfried, as usual, prepared for us a very interesting session which will be vitally important for our future. 
Winfried, who has been meeting twice uh, with Princess Aya uh, to discuss the issue, has been presenting today the concept of an international horse sports confederation, which could be created as a formal vehicle for cooperation between IFHA and FEI. This follows the affiliation of IFHA with the OIE, the World Animal Health Organization, who, as Dr. Valla told you, is presently working on the concept of a high health, high performances subpopulation of horses in order to facilitate their international movements. Dr. Brian, the chairman of IFHA committee, told us that safe international movement of horses depends on the integrity of health certification and that we must trust but verify. He concluded, in defining the five priorities of the committee, which clearly will need financial resources from IFHA to achieve them. Jim organized three excellent presentations on some of our commercial issues concerning promotion, marketing, and branding of racing. Mike Mulvale told us that we are all in the media business, and I totally agree with him after spending more than 45 years in the racing world. I wish a great success to Fox Sport and the Jockey Club for their new partnership starting next February. Jean-Christophe is also available at any time to negotiate with you, Mike, the TV rights of the Qatar Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. A year ago, Jean-Christophe Giletta was still working in the sports world, even if he had taken part in the very risky organization of four races at the Stade de France in 2004. He told us today how he's intending to promote our activity, to develop new resources for the stakeholders of our industry, to build a virtuous circle, creator of value, and to implement a sustainable and profitable customer relationship. He also outlined the importance of the plan to modernize Longchamp, which present stands were masterminded by my father and Marcel Boussac in the 60s and need to be completely reviewed more than 50 years later. William Carstangen gave us the views of a very successful racing operator who organized more than 380 days each year and is a diversified racing, gaming, and online entertainment company. He organizes every year the Kentucky Derby and Oaks, and I encourage you to attend the Kentucky Derby at least once in your life, and you will never forget the moment when 150,000 people sing all together my whole Kentucky home. And I want a, a cap uh, because of the song. Uh, here are my principal conclusions. And I would like to now to thank especially France Gallo, Bertrand Bélinguer, and Hubert Monza for their marvelous hospitality at a memorable dinner at the Versailles Castle on Saturday and at its headquarters today. All the speakers and moderators who gave their time to prepare such interesting presentation. I would like to remind you that the video of the open forum presentation and panels from this conference will be available on the IFHA website, ifhaonline.org. This will strengthen our communication uh, to make known the goals, actions, and commitments of the International Horse Racing Federation to good regulation and best practices on international matters. I want also to thank my three vice chairmen and the chairman of all our committees, all exco members, who are permanently giving support to me. Dominique de Venden, uh, who has been apologizing today for uh, personal reasons, Andrew Chesser, and Martin Gaudron, who organized today's conference, all the technical teams of France Gallo and Saturn Production, and last but not least, all the interpreters. J before showing you the film, I will just give you uh, a few figures. Uh, the first one concerned uh, the uh, new uh, Longines uh, World uh, Rankings, uh, which have just been uh, given to me uh, from the handicappers. Trev will become joint leader uh, with Black Caviar at 130 in the next rankings that will be uh, published soon. Uh, Wisedine will remain number two. Uh, and uh, uh, Intello will uh, go up to 124. Orfev will remain at 125, and Kizuna will go up at 121. So it gives a total of 500. Uh, if I'm good in mathematics, uh, it means an average of 125. Try to do better. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, some information about yesterday. So it was uh, globally a success. Betting was up. 
Alors, we, we have also additional meetings. We do not only have Longchamp. Uh, the global uh, betting uh, for the day uh, yesterday was up by 2.3% uh, in the PMU, with a total of 30, more than 30 million euros and tw more than 20 million euros on Saturday. So the global uh, turnover for the two days is 51.5 uh, million euros. Uh, and uh, we had a, a very big increase in the betting on course uh, yesterday. Uh, certainly, the Japanese took part into it uh, with nearly 18% growth uh, of uh, the betting on course. Uh, attendance was uh, slightly down because we distributed less uh, free access, uh, but we had a big increase uh, in uh, uh, paying uh, entr entrance. So we will now, to conclude the day, uh, show you uh, yesterday's race and I thank you for your attention. pour ce Qatar prix de l'Arc de Triomphe 2013 avec un bon départ d'ensemble et notamment à l'extérieur de Joshua Tree avec Penglai Pavilion devant Oko Vango Flincher côté corps devient Going Somewhere Kazakh jaune avec un peu plus loin à l'extérieur la Kazakh bleue de Intello le numéro 17 qui est bien placé avec pour l'instant le numéro 6 Orfèvre qui est 6 7 e Kazakh noir et jaune avec également Ruler of the World qui est dans le sillage du groupe de tête un peu plus loin Vienne Trève à l'extérieur un peu mouillé aux côtés de al -Kazim pour le ton qui reste très groupé le train n'est pas très vif avec également parmi les dernier Sa Awar devant Kizuna qui patiente devant Ayalanda. Et c'est Penglai Pavilion qui est venu s'installer en tête de course devant Joshua Tui à son extérieur en troisième position. La corde Going Somewhere devant Kovango qui est en troisième position. Flincher qui n'est pas loin avec Very Nice même. Et Intello, le gagnant du prix du Jockey Club qui se rapproche à l'extérieur devant le lauréat du Derby d'Epsom qui est dans son dos. C'est Roller of the World. Accompagné encore par Leading Light alors que le grand champion japonais Orfèvre patiente pour l'instant plutôt en dehors. Et bien encore avec Pirika devant al Kazim Trève également qui est pour l'instant à l'arrière 4. L'autre japonais Kizuna est en avant-dernière position devant la jument Ayalanda qui ferme la marche. La descente avec toujours l'outsider Joshua Tree qui est en tête qui accélère un peu l'allure avec Oko Vango qui est à son extérieur Kazakh Mesh, Penglai Pavilion est librement dans son sillage avec Kazakh Bleu Intello le 17 aux côtés de Going Somewhere Kazakh Jaune. Vient ensuite Very Nice Name aux côtés de la Kazakh Verde Talk Rose de Fincher suivi par Ruler of the World gagnant le derby d'Epsom aux côtés également de Leading Light qui vient devant Sirika côté corde Méandre est au sein du peloton côté corde n'a pas eu ses avis une seconde semble-t-il Orfèvre patiente ensuite devant Trèves qui est né au vent depuis le départ pratiquement devant al avec Kizuna qui patiente encore Sawar vient ensuite devant le numéro euh, devant Ayalanda le numéro 8 qui est au dernier rang mais le peloton reste très groupé dans le bas de la descente la fausse ligne droite avec toujours Joshua Tui devant à son extérieur au Kovango Penglai Pavilion et 3 et Intello et 4 e se rapproche maintenant complètement à l'extérieur avec Parfait également Kizuna également qui déboîte à l'extérieur avec l'extérieur qui progresse vivement avec Trev qui vient à la hauteur d'Okovango avec Kizuna Kazakh bleu et euh, bleu avec euh, des parements rouges c'est Yehuta Kataki côté corps Joshua Tui se défend bien avec un peu plus loin le casim qui est pris de vitesse mais c'est Trève maintenant la vaincu qui prend le meilleur au pavillon avec Trève qui a l'avantage qu'on tente de longueur d'avance sur les japonais Orfèvre à l'extérieur un télo côté corde Kizuna qui vient à l'extérieur incroyable Trève qui a l'avantage maintenant à 150 mètres des buts devant Orfèvre un télo ainsi que Kizuna à l'extérieur Trève qui formidable ici va s'imposer rester invaincu réaliser le triplé prix de Diane prix de prix de l'arc de triomphe Trève Thierry Jarnet qui 20 ans après s'impose dans l'arc de triomphe c'est une pouliche d'exception, c'est au moins aussi bien que Pain de Célèbre et Zarkava, elle a tout fait, né au ventre.